guitar Mom still can't talk about him and I almost cry So feel you play and feel you drink and fill this house with family Kind of love a thousand miles can't wash away Cause the only God that I see is life is short and bittersweet Thank God for this Thanksgiving Funny how this all looks different, but it feels the same. Like our lives never stop changing, some things never change. So feel your plate and feel your dream. Fill this house with family. The kind of love that all these years can't wash away. Cause the older that I get, I feel like sure to lose. Thank God for this Thanksgiving. All right, so you know this is the beginning of the holiday season in the United States, and the first one is Thanksgiving. And I know a lot of you are probably ready for vacation, but don't don't forget there are still things you have to do before the vacation. Well, so one of the things is that we should learn the beauty of parallel programming. So before we start, it's always a good idea to give you a heads up. Where are we coming from? So uh, we are here because we want to be a better programmer. And uh, if you want to be a better programmer, it's really important that you know what the beasts that you are dealing with. So, uh, well, in Bonima architecture, processor is the main thing. But if you look at the processor, it's actually a processor with a lot of ALUs and a lot of uh, memory units that you can uh, you should try to activate simultaneously. And in theory, you can execute seven instructions in the same cycle. Uh, and with the uh, latest generation of the Intel processor, you are able to execute like 12 instructions in parallel. However, one thing we learned previously is that for a single program, it's almost impossible to utilize all of this LU or memory pipeline. So it turns out that we start with the idea that can we share this pipeline with other threads? So whenever one thread is um, dealing with branch or cache misses, we can find instructions from others to fill in the pipeline. So nowadays you will see a processor with um, more than one thread per core. And that's typically because we have simultaneous multi-threading. And 
the other one is that the other thing that you found is that well, we have multiple cores per socket, and that's the main character that we are going to talk about today. So to to support simultaneous multi-threading from the lecture last week, uh, uh, last time you saw that we simply need to duplicate the performance counter, uh, sorry, program counter and um, uh, architectural registers to make that happen. Uh, however, one thing to be aware is that simultaneous multi-threading hardware is essentially built on top of a superscalar hardware which means that your processor is essentially a superscalar processor that allows multiple issues in its pipeline. And building this kind of hardware has its own limitation in a way that the more parallelism, instruction level parallelism or now thread level parallelism you want to provide, the higher the complexity of the hardware logic in renaming the register, in trying to reorder instructions, trying to reschedule instructions. And that's a quadratic, um, relationship with the uh, issue with you want. So in terms of a hardware circuit, it's a lot of overhead. And however, right now you see a lot of processor, they all implemented simultaneous multi-threading. And the reason is because, well, again, uh, it's better to have it rather than not having it because since those LUs, they are wasted if you cannot fill them uh, with an, uh, a program. And the other thing, uh, is that, well, considering that we have branch mispredictions all the time, and every time we, we miss branch uh, prediction, it turns out that the, the last demo that I show you, right, 33 cycles or even more cycles are wasted. And instead of putting things or putting my resource on stuff that is uncertain, why shouldn't I put things on uh, instructions that are for sure executed from another thread? Right, so that's the the cons, uh, the philosophy of using simultaneous multi-threading to reduce the branch penalty, and uh, and the other thing is that you only need to duplicate PC and register files. So it turns out it's a good deal for the processor companies to uh, to implement. All right, so today we are going to continue our discussion on multi-threaded architecture, and then we are going to start talking about how to program on this multi-threaded processors and. Well, mainly the uh, the difficulty of programming on those processors. So uh, last time we talked about simultaneous multi-threading is essentially a superscalar processor, and the hardware complexity increases as you want to uh, provide higher parallelism or wider issue. So it's not about that we cannot build a processor support many many threads within a single pipeline. It's more about doing this is very very complex. So uh, another philosophy of supporting multi-threaded execution in a single chip is actually the case for coming from this paper, the case for a single chip multiprocessor. So uh, the idea of this chip, uh, this, this paper is coming from this observation. So as we mentioned, right, the hardware complexity of building wide issue superscalar processor or even support simultaneous multi-threading grows rapidly when you are trying to get more issue with. So this is a uh, this is a, 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 a block diagram of a die, which is 21 nanometer times 21 nanometer. Uh, from today's perspective, is a really large chip. And for this large chip, right, what I found is that, well, uh, you can put a six-way superscalar. By six-way, it means six-issue superscalar processor. Uh, and for this uh, six issue superscalar processor, you have three integer LUs, you have three floating point LUs, and, um, and 32 kilobyte uh, instruction cache and 32 kilobyte data cache. That's all you can do within this uh, die area. And another philosophy, well, but if you think, uh, uh, if we use this in a different way, right? So, uh, okay, so a good philosophy is that, right? This is like, uh, buying a house, right? So this is like a luxury house. You have everything there, right? But well, but uh, as a lot of you know, right? Like if you, I want to uh, increase the amount of uh, density of living in uh, human beings, maybe I would, uh, I would design the house differently, right? So another philosophy is this. Okay, instead of building a full-fledged, very comfortable luxury house, I build a few apartments within the same area, 
right? And so looking at this apartments, right? So initially, right, the left -hand side, you have, uh, you can think, well, we have three to six rooms uh, for a family, right? But now what they are building is actually a quad core, four core, two issue superscalar processor. So instead of building a uh, six room for a family, right now I'm building uh, uh, four apartments and each has two bedrooms, right? So it turns out, well, with, in the same area, I can now live eight people. So the same thing here is that in the same area, right now I have four different processor cores and each of them is a superscalar processor. And remember, right, the superscalar processor complexity grows rapidly when you have wide issue, right? So within the same area and with the same total amount of cache size, right? If you build in superscalar way, uh, the, the logic to issue instructions in superscalar processors is going to take huge amount of overhead. However, which, which you can see from, from this side, right? This is a huge amount of overhead. But if you, if you just build it with two issue processor, right? Then this, the hardware would be really simple. So it turns out that each processor core is only this large. And within the same area, you can put four different cores, uh, each with two issue. And by two issue here, they say, well, one of the one of the issue is for integer ALU and the other is for floating point ALUs. So uh, in other words, within the same area, now we have four integer and four floating point. So I got one more floating point unit, one more integer unit, and uh, the same cache size because I have four core and each of the core would have eight kilobyte cache uh, in instruction, eight kilobyte cache in data. So their claim is that, well, if I am not aiming at building a powerful single core superscalar processor, then within the same area, I can actually build uh, uh, less powerful cores, but more functional units. So that's the philosophy of cheap multiprocessors, right? So uh, putting it back to, uh, now, uh, to, to, to the property is the same philosophy, right? You can build luxury house within a, with the same land, or you can build apartments within that. I know the living quality is different, but you can definitely uh, live more people there, right? So that's different philosophy. And as you can hear, right, the quality, the living quality is different. So uh, right now I want you, well, before we talk, well, and so here's the concept of chip multiprocessor. So, uh, well, you probably like the colorful draw that I have. So that's why I have this version, right? So right now, if you look at the concept of chip multiprocessor, it's typically that you have processor cores and each processor core is identical to what I have mentioned previously. Each of them is a uh, uh, super scalar processor or even support simultaneous multi-threading. And then we, tip, we simply duplicate all the cores and have their data synchronized as at their last level cache. So that's what we have got uh, in, uh, in, um, uh, so far in ch building chip multiprocessor architecture. So, uh, well, so since this paper brought up uh, chip multiprocessor, and we also talk about simultaneous multi-threading. So I want you to think this question deeply. This is a very complex question to dip. I will give you more time. So uh, for this particular question, it's a simultaneous multi-threading uh, processor built on top of the superscalar processor. And let's assume it's the same uh, criteria that we have been talking about. Uh, we are building a chip with a uh, uh, four-way superscalar, which means that you can support uh, sorry, four-way simultaneous multi-threading and six-way superscalar, which is uh, the six-way superscalar is essentially the same as the paper's baseline and um, supporting four threads. And that maps well to four core processor that you can build on the same uh, area. So now I'm asking you for this five statements, how many of them do you think they are correct? Can you repeat the concept of issue? 
the issue means that how many instructions can you put into execution simultaneously in the processor? All right, let's wrap up in 15 seconds. Five, four, three, two, one, time is up. Okay, so let's take a look of what do you guys think? Wow, I love this graph, which means that we definitely need some discussion. So go ahead and do it. Oh, sorry. Thank you. 
All right, let's wrap up in 15 seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Time is up. Okay, so, aha, here we go. So, more of you think it's B, some of you think it's C, but you know, still, both of us still have very strong supporting all right so what do you guys think let's look at each sentence if we are just running one program in a system the program will perform better on an smt processor yes or no yeah. yes why because it's, it's more because it's a wider issue processor right and what's the difference be between smt and cmp Manly. So remember the analogy we have, right? Like, okay, so SNT or say superscalar in general is a big single family house, right? Once you step in that house, everything is yours, right? So if I have six rooms in a house, my whole family can use all six houses. Uh, sorry, six rooms, right? So same thing for simultaneous multi-threading. If I'm just living, uh, if it's only one program, right, it can use as many resources as possible within that SMT processor. But chip multiprocessor is small apartments, but with higher density of the apartment. So the same area, you have four different apartments, but can you go into other apartments in the same lot. No, right? Otherwise it's a crime, right? So, so the thing is the same thing for chip multiprocessor. Although you have total of eight elements, processing elements, and you have this amount of cash totally available for, uh, for programs. But remember, they are private to each of the cores. So if I'm a program, if I assign, I'm assigned to a single core, then I can only use the resources on that core. So if each core only has two uh, ALUs, then uh, you can only use that two ALUs, right? So if we are just running one program in the system, the program will perform better on an SMT processor. Is the answer yes? It sounds like it's a yes, but is that always true? How good is the IPC of your program or say ILP of your program? Ah, right. What's the philosophy of building SMT processor initially? is because a single program cannot use all the resources within a processor. So that's why we start to have the SMT, right? So for this particular statement, the answer is yes or no, or say the standard answer to this one is probably it depends. So on the positive side, you are able to use all resources within the same processor, but <sighs> The thing is that can your program use all of them? Maybe yes, maybe not, right? So from the demo we have, if you have a linked list program, right? Then there is no way you can use them since your, your CPI or, or your ILP is just low anyway, right? So it doesn't help, right? But if you have a program, like some demos we have in a previous assignment, right? You can fully exploit the ILP within your processor, then SMT would definitely help. The, well, the SMT processor is definitely a better choice, right, with wider issue. Now, so for this one, it depends. For 
second, if we are running four applications simultaneously, the cache miss rate will be higher in the SNP processor. What do you guys, what's your take on this? Yes, why? Uh huh. So, because for SMT processor, you are sharing your cache with others, so the cache miss rate is higher. Capacity, right? So, each of the core in the CMP processor only has. 16 kilobyte, which means that a program or say a thread on it on a CMP processor only has 16 kilobyte. So if you put this all together, what do you think the answer to this statement is? No, it's actually, it depends as well, all right? So this one is also, it depends, right? As you said, right? Yes, because uh, each processor has its own exclusive cache. So the memory accesses are isolated. However, did I ever say anything about what this four applications look like? No, you cannot make any assumption on that, right? What if I said I have a I have a program with large memory footprint, and the other one is like pop count, compute intensive, right? And that time, right? If you have an SMT processor, the program with large memory footprint can use all the 64 kilobyte cache to lower its cache miss rate since the pep count program is probably nothing not using it at all right on the other hand the c uh, the cmp processor would not be good for that one in a way that well the pop count program doesn't use cache at all so the eight kilobyte cache is waste, well, 16 kilobyte cache is wasted in that cache, in that case. And you cannot share it with the other program with larger memory footprint, right? Or today, if I have four different threads, each thread, they have equally amount of memory footprint. So in that case, you probably want a CMP because if everyone is fighting for cash, right? Turns out nobody would get it, right? So if you have CMP, it's better isolated, right? So the answer to this one is also it depends, right? Because if your application behave like that, right? Then that's probably better of a case. Now for the third statement, what do you think? Question, okay. So what's SMT? It's called simultaneous multi-threading, right? And we have duplicated program counters, so you don't have to switch, right? It's your instruction scheduler will pick instructions from different threads simultaneously. So it's effectively like CMP in terms of the operating system, software assistance illusion, right? Question? Well, so I would say that's also a good observation, right? The CMP processor, what if I have uh, lower cache associativity, right? Or the SMT processor has higher cache associativity because their, their size is larger. 
that could be all right but uh here i'm assuming them are going to be the same but uh even set that into consideration right the answer is still it depends don't you don't you agree <laughs> yeah so it's always so so yeah okay so how about the third statement what do you guys think it depends okay but in what way so you know it depends is probably the best answer to all the computer architecture final exam open-ended question but you have to say why it depends right and that's why you have to take gre before 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 going into grad school right there is an analytical writing part right and you must remember that right they give you a statement right what do you think of this another question not about gre right uh, there were you in a class last lecture? Okay, so the answer is that we don't duplicate branch prediction. It will be higher. Okay, what else? Well, the answer I will put it depends as well. Oh, why? All right. So think about this. It depends on what, how you design your branch predictor. If you have a local branch predictor, does it matter? If you have a local branch predictor, it means that you are training the prediction per branch separately. So does it matter if it's coming from this thread or that thread, right? Shouldn't, that's the advantage of local predictor. Even if you have a hybrid predictor, you are able to tell that too, right? So with an advanced branch prediction technology, it doesn't really matter most of the case. Well, but, if you have a global predictor, if you only have the global predictor, depending on who are you running together with, that would mess up the branch prediction sometimes, right? So I will say the answer is also, it depends. All right, can you guess what the answer for, uh, the, the 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 next question is false. Oh, that's a good observation. But you are also assuming that those four parallel threads, they are working on the same section of the code, right? What else? Well, so the answer is, again, it depends, right? Well, so there is not necessary 100% certain, right? And again, depending on your application behavior, right? And depending on how you structure your threads, how you write your code, which we will talk about. I can give you a lot of examples for that. Can you? No, no, no. So you are assuming the only way of using threads is to spawn homogeneous threads. But what if I have a thread that's working on one part of the program that I launch, and the other thread is working on some other things of the program? So saying that I'm building a software pipeline, right? One is the thread that's fetching data, and 
marshaling data from the disk. And the other one is performing computation. Okay, you gave up, right? So uh, if you have, if you structure your multi-threaded program differently, that will have different effects, right? So it depends. Now, if we are running one program with four parallel threads simultaneously, the branch misprediction will be longer in the SMT, SMT processor. Okay, very good. Right, now you know. It depends on what kind of predictors are you using. And uh, it also depends on how difficult is it to, uh, or is it easy to find instructions to uh, being hidden when a certain branch misdetection, right? So I would say there is no, uh, no answer for this question. And this is why I really love this question because, you know, one thing I feel very different in grad school and undergrad is that being a grad student, you should be aware there is no standard answer to many, many questions except for one plus one equal to two. But even with one plus one equal to two, people have different thoughts on it, right? So you should be aware that in reality, there is no absolute answer to a single question in general. So sometimes, right, 10 years ago, well, let me, let me put this in this way, right? If you ask an expert in machine learning 20 years ago, what's the best uh, classifier? They will tell you support vector machines, right? But do you think that's still the answer now? And at that time, neural networks already exist, right? So it changes era by era, time by time, age by age. And also scenario by scenario, case by case, right? So I would encourage you to think more open-minded to answers instead of always asking, hey, professor, what's the right answer? And sometimes I'm hesitate to tell you that this is the right answer because even I myself, the more I learn, the more I feel I cannot say it 100% correct. Like this question, a lot of sentences here, you can tell, you can find things to make exceptions, right? So this is what I like about this question is that there's no standard answer to each of the sentence here. And each of the sentence, if you think carefully, there are many, many, uh, many, many stuff that we can discuss. And it could be, well, if, it's a, it's, if we have a dedicated uh, research oriented computer architecture class, I bet you each of the sentence here, I can find a paper to prove it's correct or not. And you will find both ways. And it will be five lectures at least for these questions. But uh, today I just give you the feeling that, okay, right now you guys grow up, right? Please abandon your thoughts that there's always an answer to a question. Sometimes the, the best answer is it depends, right? So, you know, that's also a trick that they, you can use in your interview, right? If you hear a more open-ended question, right? You can probably say, well, I think it depends, right? And then you get yourself more time to figure out what, what's the right answer they are looking for. And sometimes you will impress people. What, yeah? When, when, when they tell you you are wrong, you can find a lot of excuses. You can find a lot of excuses, right? You can say, well, my professor say it, it, it depends. <laughs> All right. So this is what we thought so far, right? And this is, this is also something that they find in did, right? So, so, well, so this is a very, very old paper, right? It's 30 years ago, well, 20 to 30 years ago, right? So at that time, well, people are using like inkjet, printers, right? So you can see, well, it's pretty, and at that time, uh, internet is not popular. So I bet people are mailing their papers 
Okay, so uh, for this particular result, it's actually the key result from their paper. Um, the left-hand side one in each uh, group of bars is the superscalar one. And the right-hand side is the chip multiprocessor one. And this is the relatively speed up. And as you can tell, right, in many cases, right, like one, two, three, four, right, four out of the nine cases that they evaluated, um, there is little difference or uh, the superscalar processor is doing a better job, right? But, you know, the applications, if they can parallelize applications in many, many different ways, then five out of this nine can get speed up, right? So here's the thing. If you want to use quad core or chip multiprocessor better, the best approach or say the only way that you would go is you have to parallelize the program, right? So the most, in, and in fact, if you look at the design of modern processors, like this is the die photo of Intel Sandy Bridge. It's actually an A-core processor, each of them with exclusive uh, L2 cache to each of the processor core and shared L3 which is identical to the drawing that I show you. And this is the AMD Ryzen processor. So the AMD Ryzen processor, they use a so-called chiplet design. What does that mean by chiplet? Is that within a single chip, they actually have two separate uh, big die area. And on top of each die area uh, is a, a composition of four different cores. And each of the core, as what I show in the Intel processor, is that uh, they all have an exclusively private L2 cache to each of the core, shared L3 cache that is visible to the same chiplet. And, uh, but there is a tricky thing in this chiplet design is that their memory controller are visible to both of the chiplets. So the L3 cache is logically shared among different chiplets. However, if you happen to have to access this part, it would take longer time. So that's, uh, so you can see in L, at the L3 level, there is non-uniform memory access time, which is the new one architecture that you learned in, um, in uh, our textbook chapter 6.4 or chip uh, 6.5. Right, so even within a single chip right now, you have the new one behavior, but I think for the new one part, it takes a different class, which I think would be 210 or 213 to talk about this. So I would leave it alone. And we have more important things to talk in this class, which I think this part is more important. So architectural support for parallel program, right? So uh, the big thing here is, uh, you know, like the, CMP paper talked about, right? To exploit parallelism, to use chip multiprocessor, or if you really want to accelerate a single program with simultaneous multi-threading processor, the must is that you have to break your computation into multiple processes or multiple threads. And well, the difference between processes and threads in the operating system class has a very clear definition. So in operating system class, if you are breaking up your computation into different processes, it means that each part of the computation, they are isolated in a way that they have their own exclusive virtual memory address space. So their data cannot be directly visible to each other unless you go through the file system abstraction, which is the universal abstraction in Unix-based operating systems. And the other idea is called threads which means that threads is actually uh, layered below the process. And with the threat abstraction, because it's still under the process umbrella. So each separate pieces of computation written by threads, they are able to access the same virtual memory abstraction access the same virtualized memory address space. So all threads can easily access data from 
each other by just using low store instructions. Well, and in computer architecture, we are lazy. We just call everything threads because no matter it's threads or processes, they are simply the software abstraction created by the operating system. But from the hardware perspective, for us, we only receive program counters and the translated address from uh, the software layer. So there's no difference from the hardware perspective. And well, so right now we call, so, so right now when we call threads, it just simply means different hardware contexts that are in running. They could be either from different programs or the same programs. And um, well, so I should update this, right? So uh, right now, typically you would have many, many threads that's in running. So for example, every tab in your web browser is a separate process in Chrome. If you have Firefox, every tab, that's actually a separate thread. So how many tabs you have? You have this amount of threads or processes at list, right? Needless to say, you have an email application running in the backend, always notifying you. You have Twitch, you have Twitter, you have messengers that runs all the time to bother you, right? So we have lots of programs, threads going on in our system. And how our software think about this multi-threaded hardware? So as I said, right, uh, for the thread, so the thread abstraction, right, it's considering that we have separate pieces or separate computation uh, threads and each of the thread they have they can have different programs but as I said they can access data directly from each other so the software people are very very optimistic about what the hardware look like so this is the hardware they assume they assume we have cores each core have their own register including a program counter so that's how we can have threads working on different parts of the program however the data is visible to everyone. So you should have a shared memory. So that's the assumption they have regarding hardware. But from what you have learned so far, is this the hardware we have? No, right? The hardware is actually looking like this, right? So they map threads uh, uh, with this way. But don't forget, we have L1 cache that is private. We have L2 cache that is private, right? If so, what does that mean? Is that I have so, for example, in this piece of a code, I have four different loops, each working on a different part of the program, right? If I have a value like sum equal to zero, right, in a shared virtual address space, I thought everyone would see it, right? And so, for the thread one, I fetch that value. I made some modification and everyone would, yeah. And in the very beginning, everyone can get this sum equal to zero uh, from the shared memory, right? But now my thread one modify that sum equal to zero to this value after running a certain iteration. And this is now cached. So can other people see it? Right, so other do not, see the updated value in a cache and keep working. So it turns out we will get incorrect result, right? It... So you said, if you have, so you are saying a single core case, if you only have one processor. Okay, so one issue processor. Okay. Uh, can you elaborate more on your question? 
So you are assuming that you have a chip multiprocessor, and each processor has single uh, has single issue. So so so, uh, so all the instructions have to evolve sequence. But are you have having your program paralyzed? Yeah, even if I have my program paralyzed. Because... If your program is paralyzed, you can actually run other threads to on um, other cores. Yeah, but they only can share the L3 cache. They can only share the L3 cache, yes. Uh, so they will. So in L3... But still, right, for these cases, right? Right, even though I have only single issue, right? Is this still a problem if you have private cache? No? Oh, yes. Yes, right? This is still a problem. Do you agree with that? Right? So, you know, every time when software people creates problems, hardware people have to deal with it. And here are two things that hardware people propose to deal. The first thing is that in the memory hierarchy, we have to support coherency. So what does it mean by coherency? It means that it guarantees all processors would eventually see the same value when the processor needs the value at the same time. So every time when you ask the memory, what's the value of sum, we should report the same value to all processors asking that. That's called coherence. Right. No matter which processor core is asking for the value, you should present the same value to everyone. That's coherence. The other one is consistency. Is that everyone should agree the update should follow a certain order. So if I both of them share the same value, who should or who which which update should occur the first? So it's actually about the order of memory operations to be done among multiple processors. So these two things we must support to guarantee the correctness of multi-threaded programming. So for cache coherency protocol, uh, the simplest one is snooping protocol. And again, this is the simplest one. In modern processors, they have more states and things can go very, very crazy. So uh, for this simple snooping protocol, uh, the idea it's called snooping because it's actually having a separate bus to hear all the signaling from those private caches. And then by hearing those signals, they have three different states associated with each cache block of the private cache. And these signals are invalidate. Uh, these states are invalid, means that the, uh, the value in this cache block is currently not trustworthy. So if you are accessing a cache block with this state, similar to the invalid state in previously we learned in memory hierarchy, you have no choice to consider this is a cache miss and fetch the data from the lower level memory hierarchy. And the second type is called shear. It means that the data is currently also used by others. So this is like the shared living space in your apartment, right? If you are sharing your living with your friends, right? As a courtesy, you should always ask your friend if I want to use the living room, is that okay? So same thing here is that you can, um, in the shared state, everyone can read the data, but if you want to make changes to the data is not allowed unless you make the cache line to be the following state, which is exclusive. You have to ask for full permission on the data so that you can modify the data. But in the meantime, 
if one is exclusive, then the other must be invalidated, right? A very politically incorrect analogy is like um, human relationship, right? Like if you miss someone, you want that person to be your significant other, right? Then, well, you have to figure out what's the state of that person, right? Invalidate means that it's invalidate to you. And exclusive to uh, that person's significant other, right? And if it's shared state, it means that, well, the person is available for everyone to pursue. But other than um, going on a date, having a lunch or dinner, nothing else could happen theoretically, right? So that's the, that's the three different states for each cash block in this case. All right, hopefully that will help you remember. So uh, for, so if you want to support these three states, it's very easy. You simply need to extend the valid bits to be the states. So if you have three different uh, states or four different states, you only need two bits. So considering the case, like you can actually make like zero, zero and invalidate zero, one, a shared and one, zero to be exclusive, right? Then it will indicate if you can operate on this cache uh, line or not. So here's the operation of the snooping protocol and you don't have to dig into too much about the snooping protocol for this particular course. So uh, one uh, potential thing is like, okay, if it's immediately invalidate, right? Then you can actually request, uh, well, if it's invalidate, it's a miss anyway. So if you are reading it, if you are, you can actually issue a read miss uh, signal. And then once that data is arriving in your cache, you can mark it as a share because at this time, I'm only going to read it. I'm not going to do anything else, right? So it's already as a share state, right? And then uh, if you just keep reading it, right? It's just uh, the share state, right? It's like the dating relationship, right? If you see someone and, uh, it's currently invalidate because I don't know, right? And then I ask, hey, are you okay to uh, go on a dinner or lunch or something, right? Then everyone knows it's a shared state now, right? And uh, what are you talking about? <laughs> and, and then, well, if you just do things like eating lunch or dinner, right? It's still a shared state. All right. And well, it, at the same time, if you hear somebody have a right request, right, which means that somebody is going to modify it, somebody else, not you, is going to modify it, right? Like Christmas Eve, right? You are asking, oh, can I go lunch or dinner with you? And the answer is, no, who is going to ask me for that, right? And you know, oh, how broken, right? It's invalid to you. Right, but in the meantime, right, if it's right miss on the bus, it means that somebody have the right request issue. So then it's exclusive to that one got the permission to have the di Christmas dinner, right? So, uh, so that means that it's, it's exclusive to one of the core, but it must be invalidated on other cores. And same thing, right? Uh, uh, the same transition, you can probably analogize that with a lot of things in your life going on. And this is holiday season, I'm sure a lot of things are going on right now. All right, so that's a snooping protocol and you can, you can go through this uh, transition yourself and it will be really interesting. But don't stick in with that too much. One thing that I just want to let you know is that, well, if we are running coherence protocol correctly, theoretically, when the processor asks for the data, no matter which processor is asking for, at a certain cycle, at this particular cycle, everyone should see the same value. That's the meaning of coherence protocol. So how does that operate? So for example, right now, we are assuming the case that everyone got the initial value sum equal to zero at their core. Now, if I am threat one at this moment, right? Because everyone has that value. So it's a shared state. So I'm using the orange color to color it. Now, if I'm thread one, I want to update 
the sun, then I will broadcast a message called right miss, although it's not indeed a right miss, but it's actually a message that tell other people, stay away from this cash block, it's mine now, right? So then it becomes invalidated on other people. And then you can keep updating it whenever you want. And then at some point, thread three wants to update uh, some zero and well, probably not a good idea to analogy this in your real life, right? But the thing is that, okay, if some other thread would like to update the sum variable, they will follow the same protocol in a way that they will try to first, uh, well, they will try to have to read that value first because this is an accumulation, right? So they would eat, broadcast a read miss message on the bus. And when you receive that, you know that somebody is trying to update or read that data. So if it's read, right? I'm still safe in a certain way. It's a shared state, right? Then uh, I just need to write back the data first by presenting the value to the shared last level cache or the DRAM. And then you present that value to the shared last level cache and it will be broadcast to the other thread in the, uh, the other core in the meantime. So it will become, go back to shared state as well. But for the other two cores, if they don't request this data specifically, it's still an invalid state. And as you can see at this time, this thread originally they have the data, but it becomes invalidated as well. Okay, so definitely you can think there are a lot of things going on here. But from this protocol, you should at least trust that, well, now we have some mechanism to maintain the coherence of the data. And now I'm having this uh, simple program. I have a global variable called loop. I declare here, I have another thread called modified loop. And the modified loop would ask me to input a number. And uh, this number would change the loop. And if the loop is not, loop value is not equal to one, then the thread would terminate. The main program would terminate. Do you agree this program will work? All right, so that's one, the demo of it. Uh, okay, I think I'm going to use the browser this time. Okay, so first of all, hello. Let me restart it. All right, it's getting bigger. All right, so. In this series of demo, I will use two processors. One is the AMD Ryzen processor, which is uh, similar to the one that you use in your class. And the other one is the latest uh, 12th generation, which is the latest Intel Core i7 processor. And I just figured out that because the, this process is way too new. So the Linux operating system doesn't recognize it's a simultaneous multi-threading processor, but it's actually, uh, a six core processor, each core with two threads. So the numbering here is incorrect. And now um, I am running this pieces of a code, which is essential, this, essentially the same as the one that I demo, show you the demo. So this program, right? The main thread ha has a checking condition of the loop. If the loop is equal to one, then it will keep, keep, keep looping. Otherwise, it will terminate. And for the modified loop, it will take user input once and see what the input is. So right now, I'm going to build a program in different scenario, one without optimization, one with optimization. So is it showing up? Hello? No work. All right, I would just have a terminal light bulb. All right, so let me light terminal full size. 
right. So this is so for this particular program, I can let me go to uh, Okay, so for that one, I think I just made those programs through the. Okay, so right now I'm running this test loop, and then okay, give me a number that is not one, two. Okay, awesome. All right, the program finishes now. Running this with optimization. Give me a number that is not one, two. Huh. The optimization really gets is slower, right? It doesn't finish. And if you keep hanging there, it's not going to finish. Trust me. But do you know why? Okay, so here's the thing. I can use GCC dash s uh, dash all three test loop uh, c and this would give me uh actually let's open it up in the folder uh, sometimes i do think i need a reading glasses now and this is the test loop dot s all right, so looking at this pieces of a code, right? This is the modified loop code. That's okay. But if you look at the main function, right? Um, you compare this guy, which is one, with loop uh, a variable, right? And see if they are equal. So that's actually comparing if loop equal to one, agree? And then it jumped to L6, which is a label. And then what does this L6 do it? Jump, jump back to L6 again. Why do they generate this pieces of code? So if you look at the code, this is the code we have, right? And this is a global variable, which are visible to both threads. But, you know, sometimes the compiler is really smart and they are too smart in a way that when they compile the code, they optimize function by function. So from this program's perspective, right? If I'm optimizing this function, you assign loop equal to one. And from what I can tell here, no one would be modifying the loop value, right? If no one is modifying the loop value after this, should I keep checking it? So the compiler is too smart. They thought, I saw this function. You're not checking it. You're not modifying, right? Aren't you? No, right? So let's just do one check. If that's good, it's good, right? So, and when I look at this one, ah, this is an infinite loop. Okay, got it. This is how am I going to optimize your code, right? So actually, right, parallel programming is really hard. First of all, you have to deal with compiler optimization, right? So uh, not, so actually we need this keyword called volatile. If you have a shared variable coming from the global variable space. So this volatile variable actually has a different meaning of volatiles in other programming language, but in C, it simply means that this is a variable that you should try to check it. You should try to not optimizing it. So this is actually a decorative word that try to prevent compiler optimization on this particular variable. You are warning the compiler, don't do anything smart and fancy on this variable. 
do what exactly I want it to do, right? So it turns out this one would prevent the compiler to put it into register to, uh, to force the compiler to check it every time. So if right now I have, so right now I have a different version of the code, which I enable the volatile by using the if diff uh, volatile. And now if I run it, right, here is the result. So test loop all three, wait, I thought I should have the volatile. Do I, let me check the make file. Uh, so for the volatile, okay, it's still in O3. Okay, so right now, let me run this version of O3. Put a number two, wait, it's not. Okay, um, RM test loop O3. Okay, uh, make, uh, oh, you know what? Okay. Uh, test loop O3 volatile. Okay. I should do dash D volatile. Volatile. Am I doing it correct? Make test loop O3 volatile. Oops. All right, let me do something really simple. Let's just modify the code and see what's going on. Let me put volatile here. And let's make it. And let me run the test loop O3 again. Is that volatile? Two. See, this time it finished it. Right. So one thing you should learn now, right, is well, there are lots of things like this to make your multi-threaded program working. Now, with coherence protocol, can you somehow guess what's the outcome of this program? Assuming that A is already a volatile variable. All right, let's wrap up in 15 seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Time is up. Okay, let's see what you guys think. Uh -huh. Okay, some discussions are necessary. So go.
All right, let's wrap up in 15 seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Time is up. Okay, after discussion, this is our, oh, wow. So both CD and E, but at least you guys think it's not A. So A says zero. Okay, so uh, how many of the following outputs are possible? Which one? First and third. Pretty sure about the first one. So when you should say sure, sure about it's going to happen or not going to happen. Oh. It's past chance. Do you guys agree with that? How about the second one? Oh. It's not in order, but what does that mean? Well, one don't have a right back uh, uh, function, so only the thread two has to write it. So, it's so only thread two is updating that variable, right? Thread one doesn't update that variable, right? It's just simply keep checking. And thread two is only making forward progress. So, okay, technically, here's the complete answer. Because modern processor, we still guarantee in order commit. So according to thread two, you are increment your value. Even though we have out of order institution, because it's still in order commit. So A is just keep increasing, right? And because the cache coherence protocol would guarantee everyone would see the same value at the same time. So turns out, you can only see increasing values, All right? So everything with increasing value seems possible, right? How about, so this one is not possible. How about three? Why? Implementation of printf. Okay. Okay, let's run it, right? So seeing is believing. So right now I have this piece of a code, right? Exactly. Uh, okay, so that's the, oh yeah, exactly the same code, right? Except that I changed the variable loop to A, right? Now, let me run it for several times. Uh, oh, well, first I run it for one time and I tell the last 1000 character. What you just said, you don't agree with the last one? What did you see here? You agree with the last one? Okay, I heard you said that you don't agree with the last one. You don't agree with the third one. Okay, let me run more. So here we run many more. What is that? What is that? <laughs> right? So here the thing, all right? The third one also is also possible. The third one is also possible, even a demo, right? The only one that's impossible is actually the second, but why is it possible for the third one and the fourth one to happen? You cannot assume the order of each thread. Okay, so that's actually another enemy in multi-threaded programs. We have multiple different processor cores but each different processor core or each different thread or even simultaneous multi-threading, the speed of execution is non-deterministic, right? It means that, well, even though, right? Right now you go to a processor, each processor is 
actually running on a different uh, frequency, given the power control that we have every day, right? So the clock rate of each different processor core could be different. That's the source one non-determinism. Now, when did I start launching these threads, right? And again, we have way more threads or processes than the physical processor cores or the threads that the hardware can support. If you have 200 threads, everyone needs to run. So context switching in and out, right? So it, your, your thread one may not always making progress, right? Sometimes it gets switched out, right? So in the very beginning, it runs a lot faster than thread two. That's how you see a lot of ones because that was the time thread two hasn't done anything yet. And then it gets switched out. So that's why you don't see any other values than one gets printed out. And then you go back and check because it switched back and you find out, ah, it's 90. But again, it gets switched out. And when it come back, it's already a hundred, right? And for the first scenario, you know, I'm always about to say it's unlikely because it's only guaranteed in a way that you have a perfect interleaving among these two threads. Otherwise, it's almost impossible for you to see that happen. But my philosophy is that as long as, some, as, long as the probability is not zero, it will happen, All right? That's one thing that every engineer should learn. As long as the probability is not zero, you should expect it would happen, All right? So that's why software design, system design is so difficult, but that's set that aside, right? But the only thing that's not possible here is the second, but from the demo, you should be aware that um, three of the case is possible. All right, so seeing this, I think you have already experienced how difficult it is in multi-threaded architecture programming on these processors. And we will continue our discussion on this next Monday. But before you leave the classroom, just a few things to uh, remind you. First of all, we have last reading quizzes due next Monday. We will drop two of your lowest reading quizzes. Assignment for due December 2nd. And here's a bonus I gave you. If you submit the IEVAL, submit the screenshot through eLearn. It comes as a full credit notebook assignment. I know a lot of you are criticizing how harsh the TA's grading on that is, right? And, um, and right now I'm just uh, bragging him to not participate in striking rather than asking him to give you guys better grades. So definitely uh, the best chance to win your assignment Grace back is to submit that. And I will drop two of your lowest uh, notebook assignments, if including uh, the IEVAL. So here's the thing, two of your lowest written uh, home notebook assignment will be dropped and one will be replaced by the IEVAL if you submitted that. That's everything. Other than that, happy Thanksgiving. Enjoy the rest of your week.